Thanks to the power of mods, I have set all my stats in Dragon's Dogma to 1. The goal is simple, beat the base game's main questline and Bitter Black Isle, including Damon's Awakened form. Fireboy from Cool Maths Games has bravely volunteered to attempt this challenge. While Fireboy is getting eaten out by Grigori, I'll go over the rules. My health, stamina, strength, defense, magic, magic defense, and carry weight are all one point. The game will be set on hard mode. I must play exclusively in offline mode. No pawns are allowed and they must be dismissed as quickly as possible. I will not be using wake stones to resurrect myself because I'm not a giant pussy. I'm not allowed to sell the DLC gear left in the play storage at the start of the game. That's it for the rules and we can now begin. After the dragon attack, we're told to select our starter vocation, but firstly I need to set all my stats to 1. I had an easy enough time doing this using the mod dinput.dll hooks, which allows me to change my stats to whatever I wish. I set Fireboy's level to 200, then changed all his stats to 1. Since he's level 200, we won't have to worry about level ups ruining his stats. Unfortunately, Dinput doesn't let you directly change your carry weight value, so my friend Austin Shelton kindly made a mod for me that does so. Now Fireboy will be encumbered whenever his inventory weighs over 1kg. My second issue was with stamina. I could use Dinput to change my stamina to 1 point easily enough, but whenever I went through a loading screen, it would force my stamina back to default. So Austin made me another mod to fix that, and now my stamina is at a single point. Thank you for your service, Austin, and none of this would have been possible without your help. That being said, you are basically the enabler of my imminent suffering, so I don't know if I should be thanking you for allowing me to subject myself to this challenge. With Fireboy's stats finally at 1, I picked Strider as my starter vocation. My clothes encumber me, so I sold all of them and will basically be naked for almost all of this run. Since my health and defenses will only be 1, armor serves little purpose. I deposit basically everything, including my lantern. All of this stuff is too heavy to justify carrying around. Sprinting and carrying objects in towns doesn't cost stamina, so I can run however much I like when in a safe zone, but I'll be doing the tired run animation the entire time. I spend 20 minutes doing side quests and foraging around Cassidus for golden experience, before buying a single throw blast from Estelle. Throw blasts only weigh 0.27 kilograms, so I can carry three of them at a time. But because of money constraints from not selling my DLC items, I had to adopt a more frugal mindset. That didn't stop me from buying a short bow from her, however, as it weighs almost half as much as a rusted bow, which I'll be keeping in storage alongside my rusted daggers. Fireboy acquaints himself with a rook, who tragically slipped while walking in the shallow water, becoming tasty brine food in the process. Fireboy begins shooting seagulls, bunnies, and other innocent woodland creatures to farm discipline. Simply pressing the sprint button while moving will automatically exhaust him, so Fireboy resorts to bunny hopping to get around. He then opens the chest below the encampment and finds a shoulder cape which gives 30 stamina. This is pretty significant, but not as much as you might think. I still run out of stamina basically immediately if I sprint, but it does let me hold overworld objects for about a second without becoming immediately exhausted. It's already evening by the time I reach the encampment, and I make sure to pick up the liquid vim sitting on the shelf. The Riftstone then tells us to defend the soldiers from the Cyclops attack happening outside. Good thing Fireboy purchased a single throw blast for this specific occasion. He confronts the Cyclops and completely whiffs his throw. The Goblin takes advantage of the fact that he only has one health point and smacks the ever-living daylights out of him. Instead, he persuasively encourages the Cyclops to have an accident near this cliff, and we get to save our throw blast for a later encounter. After talking to the Riftstone again, Fireboy finally reunites with Watergirl. Night has fallen by the time they head back to Cassidus, and Watergirl decides to go back to her people. Aura happens to be there too, and she invites Fireboy to Bitter Black Isle. I ask you, is that the fate you've chosen of your own will? Upon arriving at Bitter Black Isle, I beeline for the notice board quests and try to loot whatever rift crystals I can find. We'll need a lot of them. I enter the Garden of Ignominy, looting some chests here and there while bunny hopping past all the enemies, making my way to Duskmoon Tower. We're then ambushed by Barok proceeds to be nothing but incredibly helpful to us. He buys some of the stuff I looted in the dungeon, and we end up with around 70,000 gold. There's a lot of wildlife to farm in Dustmoon Tower, but I won't be slaughtering them yet. I head to the right and enter this lower building, placing two barrels near the left door. Even with Shoulder Cape, I can barely hold the barrels for a second before becoming exhausted. There is an exploit where you can unequip and re-equip your weapon to cancel the exhaustion animation, but this only seems to work if you've been exhausted by a skill. By placing the barrels near this door, I can perform what's commonly called barrel clip, but no matter how much I try, I can't get the clip to work because my stamina keeps running out. 
That's why I picked up that liquid vim earlier. I drink it, and for 60 seconds, I don't drain any stamina. My time is short, so I place one barrel by the right corner of the door, then pick up the other barrel and stand inside the first one. I jump in place while holding the second barrel and phase through the door, helping myself to the Ring of Perseverance inside. I then pick up the barrel through the door and replicate the glitch to get back out. Fireboy doesn't have enough carry weight or liquid vims to clip through the other doors, so I leave them for later. The Ring of Perseverance gives you a 50% bonus to your discipline gain, so we can level our vocation rank faster. I need to get Strider to rank 5 so I can unlock Forward Roll. With the ring equipped, I go around shooting all the local Duskmoon Tower inhabitants and get to Strider rank 3. By now, I could purchase the Augment Endurance to give myself an extra 100 stamina, but there's something else I should do first. My game is currently set on hard mode, so I go into settings and switch it to normal. I then quit to main menu and reselect hard mode from there. Doing this causes the game to reset your quest progress, but your character retains their experience and items. It's basically the same as forcing a new game plus. After doing this, I'm back at the start of the game, so I get rid of my clothes, grab my bow, and the Ring of Perseverance, and essentially redo most of what I did before. Meet Rook, kill Rook, shoot birds, go to encampment, talk to Rock, Cyclops has a four, high water girl, buy water girl. I go back to Cassidus and sleep until night to spawn Aura, letting her take me back to Bitter Black Isle. I grab the notice board quest again, go into Garden of Ignominy, enter Dustmoon Tower, and meet Barok again. Then I head to the same place I did the barrel clip at and perform the glitch once more. The chest contains another Ring of Perseverance and I finally have two of the ring equipped, doubling my discipline experience earned. I go on another animal killing spree and get to rank 4 in Strider. After all the animals in Dustmoon Tower are dead, I get Aura to take me back to Cassidus and I kill some rats, finally reaching rank 5 in Strider. I bunny hop to the encampment, still shooting birds on the way there and unlock forward roll, double vault, and endurance. Dodging and double jump don't cost stamina, so my maneuverability has seen a massive increase. The augment endurance gives me an extra 100 stamina, which is still barely anything, but it does let me carry overworld objects for a little bit longer. Plus, I no longer need to wear the shoulder cape and have it weigh me down. My next goal was going to be swapping to fighter and getting it to vocation rank 5. This is because Fighter gets the Augment Sunu at rank 5, which increases your encumbrance by 20 kilograms. One day, I was discussing this one stats challenge run with my brother, and when I mentioned using Sunu, he called me a pussy, which is incorrect, for I am very brave. This is why I have decided not to use Sunu or any carry weight buffs at all. I will only be able to carry one kilo worth of items for the rest of the playthrough. Now that I don't have to grind out fighter ranks anymore, Fireboy rolls into the Ward of Regret. He rolls past all the enemies and goes straight into the Midnight Helix. My goal is to reach the top of the tower so I can grab the Void Key and a level 3 novelty from the chest. Even with dodge roll, it proves difficult to survive all the enemies. After a couple more attempts and a close call with Steve the Gargoyle, I got the items I needed and Livestone Fireboy the hell out of there. I got Aura to purify the level 3 cursed novelty I got from the chest, ended up rolling an incredibly underwhelming drop. The drop I'm looking for is Scroll of Tenacity. There are 12 potential drops you can get from level 3 novelties, so my chances of getting the scroll I want aren't very promising. Because cursed item rolls are seeded, you can't save scum to get the drops you want. I'm going to have to do more Midnight Helix runs for level 3 novelties, but most importantly, I need more Rift Crystals. There are a couple ways to solve that issue, and one of them was to head to Grand Sorin. Before that, however, I got Aura to swap Fireboy's vocation from Strider to Mage. To get to Grand Sorin, we have to head back to the encampment and face the Hydra there. I throw a couple barrels at one of its heads and get Fireboy to do a couple basic attacks with his staff to end the fight. Mercedes wants Fireboy to take the Hydra's head to the Duke of Grand Sorin. He meets up with her at the waypoint where an ox is pulling the Hydra's head. This quest is why I swapped Fireboy to Mage. The ox moves rather slowly, but you can kick it to make it sprint for a short bit. Each time you kick it, it loses health. The lower its health, the less distance it sprints when you kick it. Because Mage has healing spells, I can heal the ox when its health gets low to help it retain its speed. Here's how the ox quest went. Fireboy kicks the ox over the bridge until we reach the first batch of goblins. There, he sets the goblins on fire using Ingle, which is very on brand for him. A single spell was enough to completely drain his stamina, but there's a convenient exploit to overcome this. I mentioned this earlier, but when your character becomes exhausted, you can unequip and re-equip your weapon to cancel the exhaustion animation. This means I could spam Ingles however much I wanted. Thanks to the burning status of Ingle, I could slowly but surely whittle down the health of the goblins, harpies, and wolves that attacked us on the road. While destroying the rock I found another shoulder cape in a chest and equipped it. The extra 30 stamina made it possible to shoot two ingles in one stamina bar. I can assure you that no one on this planet has ever been more excited than me about a shoulder cape. It took about 30 minutes to finish the quest, but after fully healing the ox and kicking it all the way during the last stretch, we finally made it to Grand Sorin.
I immediately headed for the inn, and thanks to the monsters we killed on the way here, I had enough discipline to buy levitate for my staff. Then I went to the pawn guild, in which I headed straight for the lowest floor and accepted the first six from a different sky quests. This is a series of fetch quests in which you have to pick up a bunch of badge of vows, which are scattered throughout the map. Upon collecting them, you are rewarded with rift crystals. I used the eternal fairy stone to port back to Cassidus and picked up the first four badges, giving me around 6,000 crystals in a few minutes. I teleported back to Aura to purify the level 3 novelty I picked up earlier, and got yet another useless scroll. I do some more from a different sky quest for Rift Crystals, then I head back to BBI and do some more Midnight Helix runs. After each run, I would sleep at the inn for about 4-5 to five days to reset the chests, before teleporting back to BBI and ascending the Midnight Helix for the chest at the top. I did a lot of these runs, and my purification luck was frankly awful. Each time I ran out of Rift Crystals, I'd do some more from a different sky quests. During one of these runs, I took a detour to the lower room in Duskmoon Tower. I performed the barrel clip on the door to the left side and was able to get my hands on Dragon's Eye, a very powerful short bow. Since I was running out of Rift Crystals, I did some more from a different Sky Quests. One of them took me into the Everfall, so I talked to Barnaby and figured I'd get that quest done while I got the badge. I grabbed some daggers from my storage and an Eternal Fairy Stone, unlocked the skill Helm Splitter, and headed down. I walked up to the edge of the Everfall and while walking, I activated Helm Splitter. It sent me down the Abyss, but I landed safely below without taking any damage. This is because Helm Splitter on its own isn't considered jumping, so it never triggers a state in which you can technically receive full damage. That being said, if you jump from a great height and use Helm Splitter, you will take damage because you had jumped beforehand. I grabbed the port crystal and activated the thing below it, waking up the evil eye and very stoning back out. Sir Duncan handed me my worm hunt license, but this single piece of paper was awfully heavy, so I got Arsalan to hold on to it for me. Then I realised I forgot the badge of vows in the Everfall, so I went back in and picked it up. Back to the level 3 novelty grind, I have more poor luck as per usual. Each bad purification feels more demotivating than the last. But after many hours of mindless farming, I locked out and finally got the scroll of tenacity. Oh my god, thank Christ almighty. Unfortunately, this augment costs 11,000 discipline to learn. I swapped Fireboy to Magic Archer, equipped both rings of Perseverance, and had him go on yet another wildlife slaughter session. Even after all that, I didn't have enough discipline, so perhaps it was now a good time to continue the main quest. I grabbed the port crystal I got from the Everfall, deposited my magic bow, and took my worm hunt license with me to Maximilian. He offered us four quests, but only two were necessary to advance the main quest. I picked a cipher text and cult investigation. The fort has too much combat and takes forever, while the research asks you to carry very heavy objects, which frankly speaking, is impossible for me. I rolled straight to Hilfiger Knoll and met with the Dragon Forge. After exiting his cave, I placed my port crystal down, removing my over-encumbered status. Then I rolled back inside and stole the port crystal he had in his cave, and rolled it with me to the catacombs, where I've decided to leave it for now. I teleported back to Grand Soren and grabbed a magician's crutch and two throw blasts, capping out my inventory limit. Then, teleported back to the catacombs where I left my poor crystal. Fireboy rolled inside, skipping a large section of the dungeon by clipping through this metal door. After dispatching all threats, Fireboy successfully clips through the door and heads to the lower part of the dungeon. He rolled past all the enemies until he made it to the final room, triggering the cutscene. Zombies started attacking him, so I grouped some together to throw blast them and killed the rest by spamming normal attacks with my magic bow, which took forever. After the enemies are dead, Mason gets Fireboy to kill a guy and we're free to teleport back out. I grab my worm hunt license that I had deposited earlier and report back to Maximilian. He let us see the Duke. Then, Chamberlain Aldous asks us to kill a griffin and judge Fornival for his trial. I definitely don't want Fornival to be arrested, so I collected all the positive evidence from the relevant witnesses. The trial ends in four days, so I'll go kill the griffin in the meantime. I can carry a maximum of four throw blasts, so I emptied my inventory and took them all with me. Using a dead spider, I lured the griffin down and started throwing. Even after landing direct headshots, the damage from all four throw blasts wasn't enough to kill the griffin outright. I didn't want it flying away to Blue Moon Tower, because fighting it there is a pain. Thankfully, I made a checkpoint save, just in case this strat didn't work, and reloaded at the inn. I deposited Fireboy's throw blast, then slept at the inn for four days straight. Bourneville's trial had ended at this point, and thanks to the evidence I gathered, he was found not guilty. 
Carnival was rather thankful we saved him and gave Fireboy a 10% discount on his wares, letting me purchase a Maker's Finger for 270,000 gold. One problem, the Maker's Finger is 5.14 kilograms, so I can't buy it, let alone carry it. Well, not with that attitude I can't. Instead of trying to buy it directly into my inventory, I purchased it into my storage. I ran back to the inn and equipped my short bow. Then I pulled the Maker's Finger from my storage. For some reason, you can go above your carry weight limit when taking items from your storage or when looting off the ground. But once that item takes you over your carry limit, you can't pick up anymore. I rolled back to the griffin, lure it down, and shoot it with the Maker's Finger, saving me the trouble of chasing it to Blue Moon Tower. After buying that Maker's Finger, I'm rather poor and would rather not be. I turn in my completed quests, then head back to BBI. I get Ulra to change Fireboy back into Magic Archer, and I've already gotten it to rank 4 passively. Because of this, I can purchase the Orkman Potential, which gives me another 100 stamina. Now Fireboy has a total of 201 stamina, which means we can sprint for a few seconds and carry objects for quite a while. Using Magic Bow skills still completely wipes the stamina bar, however. It's time to roll back to Dustmoon Tower, and thanks to my biggest stamina bar, it's easier to perform the Barrel Clip to grab some more high value items. They are very heavy, however, so I have to sell them to Barok as soon as I get them. After selling a few, I'm comfortably sitting at over 2 million gold. My next goal was to get Dragon's Eye to 3 star enhancement, which is easy enough. All you need are 2 lava rocks, which can be found in the Ward of Regret. I could have used a pickaxe, but there are bats that spawn along the ore deposit. Instead, I brought 4 throw blasts with me and threw them at the bats to kill them, then at the ore deposit to break it. I sifted through the debris for lava rocks, picked up two of them, then rolled back to Barok. In hindsight, it would have been easier to bang my way to the Warrior's Respite, which was only two rooms away from Duskmoon. Warrior's Respite is a safe zone with ore deposits that can give lava rocks, and Barok even lives there for a rarefy immediately after, so it would have been perfect. Regardless, I had the means to three-star Dragon's Eye now, so it was time to confront the Gazer. I rolled through the gutter of misery until I got to the Shrine of Futile Truths. So far, this one stat challenge run hasn't been very difficult. There have been some frustrating moments thanks to poor RNG, or even a tedious section here or there, but nothing that feels like a wall. Every challenge has had an immediately identifiable solution that feels actually possible to execute. The Gazer is the first true roadblock for this challenge. When you stand in the middle of these stairs and chuck a throw blast into the Gazer's eye, his AI has a habit of freezing up. His tentacles won't cast spells, or they'll do so far less frequently. You only have to worry about his gaze attack, which you can just turn around the opposite way to avoid. This meant I could just shoot his eye without worrying too much about any spells. At least, that was the idea. After carrying my bow and one throw blast, my carry weight was maxed out, so I couldn't consistently stagger him with hand grenades to break his AI. Earlier, I said that the gazer didn't have an immediately identifiable solution, making it the first roadblock in this challenge. But that isn't really true. With one single change to my build, I could borderline trivialize the entire challenge, which is something I didn't want to do. So I kept stubbornly facing the gazer over and over again. What did my stubbornness amount to in the end? An incredibly depressing death montage. Before you say anything, Maker's Finger only deals about one health bar of damage to major boss enemies like the Gazer and Daemon, instead of outright killing them. Because I couldn't use my Throw Blast to break his AI at the start of the fight, it was a better idea to save it for a better time. My strategy was to focus on dodging the Gazer's spells and wait for him to summon his large tentacle from the ground. I lure it under him so he pierces his own eye, then focus on damaging him while he's vulnerable. Then I dodge even more of his spells, wait for the tentacle attack again, and slowly whittle him down this way. Instead of using my throw blast at the start of the fight, I wait until he hits himself with his own tentacle and throw it at him while his eye is dangling out, dealing double damage due to his knockdown state. I alternated between the upper level and ground level depending on the situation, but found ground level to be surprisingly safe. When the gazer summons his little spell casting tentacles, you can just roll far away from them and they'll cancel their spells. The sound cues in this fight were a godsend. Because bow aim narrows your ability to see your surroundings, I knew to roll away whenever I heard a tentacle pop up next to me, or to start rolling away when I heard a spell being cast. Slowly but surely, the gazer fell by his own tentacle.
Their final successful attempt took 30 minutes. Somehow, I dodged all of Gaze's attacks for 30 minutes straight. One of the hardest challenges in this run had been surmounted, and I didn't even have to rely on that game-breaking ability I was talking about earlier. Remember how Fireboy spent a very long time farming the Augment Tenacity? Why was he trying so hard to get it? Tenacity is an augment that gives you a 90-95% to chance to survive a lethal blow on 1 HP if your health is above 90%. Because Fireboy's health is stuck at 1, we can only be at either 100% health or 0% health, with no in-between. So, whenever he takes damage, he has a 90-95% to chance to survive the attack, meaning he is basically immortal. Naturally, this has completely overpowered and can trivialize this challenge run, so despite spending several hours trying to get it, I won't be using Tenacity unless it is absolutely necessary, like if there's a part of the game where you must take damage and can't avoid it. I decided to head straight to the Dark Bishop and roll through all the enemies. I had no plan for fighting him, so I just shot him a bunch. My damage against the Dark Bishop was actually a lot better than the Gazer, but after a few minutes, he teleported into his pet dragon. I tried shooting it, but was only dealing one damage. His dragon has 12,500 health, and I am not going to shoot it that much. I left the area, taking what I've learnt to apply for a future strategy. My top priority should be increasing my numbers, so perhaps it's time to Dragonforge my bow. Aside from Grigori and the online Ur Dragon, Cursed Dragons have the highest Dragonforge rate, so I need to farm them. But as we can see, I don't exactly do any damage to them right now. Using the Maker's Finger will only deal 4 health bars of damage. The most efficient method would be getting Grigori over and done with, while also reaping the benefits of his guaranteed dragon forging. It's back to the main quest, and Fireboy talks to Mercedes. She says to meet her at Windbluff Tower, so I teleport to Hilfiger Knoll and roll south to reach the location. Mercedes confronts Julian and they start fighting. Instead of killing Julian outright, I watch Mercedes get her ass beat. As a reward for not interfering, she gives me a silver rapier. I can then sell her heartfelt gift for some nice gold. It then occurs to me that I want to make sure Fornival ends up my beloved. I can do this by completing the Land of Opportunity quest. Fireboy must illegally evict a family of peasants. This requires chasing their child through the streets and physically restraining him. Unfortunately, Jasper wasn't awake yet, so I couldn't tell him to pack up and leave. In the meantime, I decided to chase down Salamet. I beeline for the ancient quarry. I meet Salamet there and shoot him so hard it triggers his plot armor, so now we have to chase him to Blue Moon Tower. Fireboy teleports to Hilfiger Knoll, then spends about 5 minutes rolling to Blue Moon from there. He rolls past all the enemies, reaching Salamet at the top of the tower. Fireboy then becomes the first person in the world to not one-shot Salamet, taking a couple of arrows to take him down. Fireboy reclaims the Worm King's ring and wants to pick up the port crystal here, but his inventory is very capped out. He teleports back to Grand Soren to hand in his completed quests. Fireboy finally gets to speak to Jasper, who agrees to leave his property and Fornival is very happy. This has earned Fireboy some Fornival Riz points and a place on the Grand Soren watch list after chasing Jasper's child through the streets. Now it's time to report to Chamberlain Aldous. The Worm King ring is very heavy, so it serves no purpose for us. I just give it back normally. Aldous then tells us to go to the Mountain Way Castle, so Fireboy teleports to Cassidus and rolls to the location from there. Then he's told to go back to Grand Soren, so he teleports back to fight some cock. I chuck a coin purse of charity I purchased from Fornival earlier at its sack. This takes out an entire health bar, as coin purse of charity is the most powerful throwing item in the game. It's also incredibly heavy, so we can only ever carry one at a time no matter what. It's then just a couple minutes of shooting the cockatrice until it finally flees, before reporting back to Aldous. He tells us we did great, and to talk to the Duke. Idle forgeries are Fornival's favourite gift, so Mountie Bank makes three of them. Fireboy goes to hand them to Fornival, but is tasked with babysitting his daughter for the day. He still manages to hand in the three idols before doing Fornival's favour. Fireboy absolutely nails the escort quest and finally maxes out his Fornival Riz points. Fireboy finally heads to the Great Wall and rolls past all the enemies. Suddenly we're forced to kill a Chimera. I target the lion's head first, because if the goat dies, the lion gains more defense. After killing the snake, the Chimera is stunned, so I use the nearby Ballista to shoot at it, dealing a nice chunk of damage. Once it gets back up, I focus on avoiding attacks while shooting the lion's head, and eventually the lion dies, leaving just the goat on its own. The goat goes down easily, and we can move on to the Skeleton Lord. Basically, I dodge his attacks, trying to get behind him while shooting his weak points whenever possible. He dies after a few minutes, and it's time to finish up the Great War quest. The Elysian summons two whites, but Fireboy brought another coin purse of charity with him before coming here. He throws it at one of the whites, killing it instantly. 
the final white goes down easily enough. The Elysian is impressed by Fireboy's skill, then gets pressed into the ground by Grigori. Grigori is all like, fight me pussy, you won't. And he's right. I'll finger him instead. Fireboy teleports back to Grand Sorin and tries to put the Maker's finger he purchased earlier from Fornival into his inventory, but weirdly enough, the game won't let him. With our Dragon's Eye Shortbow and Eternal Fairy Stone in our inventory, our encumbrance value is 0.95, which is apparently too much to be able to carry a Maker's finger. I deposit my Fairy Stone and am finally able to withdraw the Maker's finger. Since we can't carry our Fairy Stone, however, I have to roll all the way from Grand Sorin to the Great Wall. Fireboy rolls a few minutes to the Great Wall to face Grigori. From there, he heads into the Tainted Mountain, rolling past all the enemies until he reaches the final room before Grigori's lair. We need to lower these four pressure plates in order to open the door. Thankfully, there's a big chunky gore chimera here with a weight value of 2,000 kilograms. I lure it over to the pressure plates and is able to lower them very quickly as it steps on them. After having him step on all four, the door opens and I roll on through. What is your purpose here, Arisen? Grigori questions why Fireboy is here, but more importantly, questions his taste in Beloveds. After admiring Fornival's double chin clipping through his collar, Fireboy fingers Grigori so hard he spontaneously combusts, then has a hot makeout session with Fornival. Fireboy wakes up in his house in Cassidus, and Fornival is with him. Because Fornival is his beloved, Fireboy can easily access the merchant's wares. Our bow, Dragon's Eye, has also been dragon forged, reducing its weight value further and increasing its other stats. We now have a better chance against the bosses of BBI, but it'd be good to rarify it if possible. To reach Silver Forged Enhancement for Dragon's Eye, we need six Crimson Stones, which are dropped from Piosaurians. I made my way to the Pilgrim's Gauntlet and picked up this vase full of water. It extinguished the Saurian's flames after I chucked it at them. Then I used a coin purse of charity to one-shot the creature. It dropped a Crimson Stone immediately, so I went back to Mountie Bank in Grand Sorin. I had him duplicate the Crimson Stone six times, then I found Barok back in BBI. Fireboy had barely enough Rift Crystals to rarefy the bow, but thanks to the six Crimson Stones, we now have a Silver Forged Dragon's Ire. I still wasn't quite ready to tackle the Dark Bishop yet. I swapped my vocation from Strider to Assassin, equipped my Dragon's Ire Shortbow, and two Rings of Perseverance. After teleporting back to Grand Sorin, I went to the castle to speak to the Duke. Fireboy dealt cringe damage to a Redditor by exposing him to sunlight, then kicked him through the window so he could touch grass. The Redditor sent his moderators after Fireboy and the horde was endless. This was perfect, because it meant I could shoot them for as long as I liked in order to farm discipline. I spent several minutes shooting the guards, until I reached rank 9 in Assassin. Afterwards, I ran to the center of the city. I will die if I faceplant while falling down the Everfall, but I can press R2 to grab onto a ledge and safely land. I didn't need anything here as of this moment, so I used the fairy stone the game gave me just now as a quest reward and went to the inn. I unlocked the assassin augments Autonomy and Bloodlust. The former increases my strength and magic by 20% while I'm traveling alone, along with a flat 90 damage reduction. Bloodlust provides the exact same benefits, but the effect is only active when it's nighttime. I want to quickly talk about how the 1kg limit on my carry weight makes it very difficult for me to use certain vocations. What you see on screen is the lightest weapon at 0 star enhancement for every vocation. As you can see, many vocations have their lightest weapon weighing over a kilogram, which means I can't equip it. I could use these vocations unarmed, but well. I'd also rather avoid being in melee range if I only have 1 health. Anyway, I'm pretty sure I can take on the Dark Bishop now. I sleep until nightfall to activate the Bloodlust Augment and head to BBI. I take Dragon's Eye and two Throw Blasts with me, and even purchase the skill Fractured Art. This skill has incredibly high base damage, but it will drain my entire stamina bar if I use it. Thankfully, the Unequip Reequip exploit can completely bypass the exhaustion animation, letting me spam the skill infinitely. This strategy ended up being ridiculously effective against the Bishop. The 
Dark Bishop does not take explosions to the head very well, and even after possessing his dragon, Fracture Dart was strong enough to break the damage threshold. This ended up being an incredibly easy fight. Fracture Dart can only be unlocked at vocation rank 8 for Strider, but it still would have been worthwhile to farm it during the early game of this challenge run. I've always known Fracture Dart was an absurdly powerful skill. What I didn't know was how powerful it was even with absolutely garbage stats. With the Dark Bishop slain, all that's left is Daemon's first and second forms. I roll through the Rotwood Depository and Forgotten Hall until I get to the Arisen's Respite to meet up with Barok. I had no intention of fighting Daemon yet. First, I wanted to get my bow gold forged. Dragon's Ire requires two Fire Drake Fangs to gold forge, and thankfully, you can find a Fire Drake not too far from where I am. Fireboy leaves the Arisen's Respite, making his way through the Bloodless Stockade. This is the darkest area in the game, and lanterns are too heavy to be worth carrying around, so you're going to have to use your imagination for this footage. After some blind muscle memory navigation that reminds me that I've essentially made playing this game my job, Fireboy finds himself in the spy yard of Scant Mercy. A living armor is standing there menacingly, eagerly awaiting for its next target, but it doesn't yet realize it as Dragon's Dogma AI. The door to the Fallen City opens, but we won't be going there yet. Instead, Fireboy rolls up the stairs and heads back into the Bloodless Stockade. He then goes back into the Spy Yard of Scare Mercy, and a Fire Drake has spawned to take the place of the Living Armor. I brought two Throw Blasts with me on the way here and chucked them at the Drake's head. The plan was to break off its horns, loot the Fire Drake fangs, then leave but his horns remained firmly affixed to his head. It took many minutes of spamming Fractured Art on the poor Drake's head until at long last his horns broke. There was still a chance that he'd drop a dragon horn instead of a fang, but RNG looked kindly upon me that day. After offering a quick prayer and thanks, I steal his fang off the ground and head to Grand Sorin. Back in Grand Sorin, Fireboy asks Mounty Bank to create two extra copies of the Fire Drake Fang. Then he heads back to Barok to at last get his bow gold forged. While duplicating the Fire Drake Fangs at Mounty Bank earlier, I came to a potentially groundbreaking realization. When Mounty Bank returns a duplicated item, it goes directly into your inventory, even if you're over max carry weight. This could potentially mean that if he duplicates blast arrows, I could hypothetically carry an infinite amount of them. I couldn't wait to test this theory, and I know that Damon wasn't looking forward to the answer. I spent a little less than an hour duplicating blast arrows until I had 30 in my inventory. My theory was correct. Because Mounty Bank gives duplicates directly into my inventory, it kept exceeding my carry weight, regardless of my encumbrance status. The downside to this method is that it can be incredibly expensive, but it's also just very time consuming. I went back to BBI and purchased Fivefold Flurry from Aura. After performing an absolutely crazy trick shot on a spider, I rolled through the Rotwood Depository into the Forgotten Hall and made a checkpoint save at the Arisen's Refuge. Then, rolled through the Bloodless Stockade and Spy Out of Scant Mercy, entering the Fallen City for the first time. This area doesn't spawn enemies upon your first visit, so I leisurely looted chests for Rift Crystals before finally confronting Daemon. I have raised my strategy for Daemon was to slowly whittle him down with Fractured Art, using the unequip reequip exploit to cancel the exhaustion animation. My first couple of tries were very messy, but I soon figured out when to focus on dodging or damaging. Fractured Art was doing pretty crazy damage, so I decided to test out Blast Arrows. To my immense disappointment, they did basically fucking nothing and I wasted all that time duplicating them for no reason. Fractured Art has high base power and high strength scaling, while Blast Arrows don't actually have all that much base power, but very high strength scaling. This made them very ineffective for a character that has basically no stats. Damon was still beatable, but I wanted to go back and prepare a plan B. Since Blast Arrows are actually worthless here, I saw them all and visited Mounty Bank again. I got him to start duplicating my Conqueror's Periaps instead. I decided to duplicate 12 Periaps for now. Consuming one Periapt increases your strength by 20%, and they stack up to a maximum of 4 times. These boosts stack multiplicatively, for a total of 2.07 times strength. I will be using 4 Periapts at a time, and this boost only lasts 1 minute, so with 12 Periapts, I can essentially double my strength for 3 minutes. After duplicating 12 Periapts at Mounty Bank, Fireboy rolled back to Damon's room to try again. I used 4 Periapts right off the bat, and the damage was pretty nutty. After a couple of attempts, Damon's head was turned into a fine red mist, thanks to Fractured Art.
Damon's first form went down easy enough. After that, the game spits us back out onto Bitter Black Harbor. We'll have to complete BBI again in order to access the second form. I saw some BBI equipment I found while inside and made a pretty penny. Hopefully this means money won't be a problem for the rest of the run. To beat Damon's second form, I came up with the genius idea of using the exact same strategy I used for his first form, except I'd bring even more parry apps this time. But before I went back to Mandy Bank, I first wanted to unlock all the shortcuts in BBI. Since this is our second time going through the labyrinth, all the fights are skippable and no keys are required to unlock doors. Fireboy ends up rolling through all of BBI, skipping every single enemy including the bosses, unlocking the shortcut after the gazer and the one after the bishop. Now that the shortcuts are open, I go back to Grand Sorin to see Mountie Bank again. I get Mountie Bank to duplicate 28 Conqueror's parry apps, giving us 7 minutes worth of double strength boosts. I'm honestly sick and tired of doing these mass duplications, and hopefully that's the last time I have to do it. Fireboy teleports back to BBI with his parry apps in hand, and takes the shortcut into Rotwood Depository, rolling through the Forgotten Hall, Bloodless Stockade, the Spy Yard of Scant Mercy, and Fallen City finally making his way to Damon again. Because we're no longer required to fight any bosses or enemies, it took barely any time to get back to Damon. We have to fight Damon's first form once again, which you've already seen me do, so I'll skip to the part where he's dead on the floor. Damon's second form is a whole new beast, with buffed stats, more powerful spells, and even his weak points are more difficult to access. Worse yet, if I die during his second form, I have to fight his first form all over again, as the game doesn't let you save in between phases. Okay, let's cut the dramatic music, I'll stop pulling your leg now. Damon's second form was a complete joke. Just reaching the boss room was harder than his second phase. Damon loses all his speed in exchange for higher defenses and stronger spells. This means the issue of finding an opening to fire Fracture Dart is basically gone. Damon just hovers there, slowly flits around, and casts a spell every now and then. To be fair, his cast speed is very fast, and he tends to fire greater quantities of projectiles, but you only have to dodge those occasionally. In the end, I aimed Fracture Dart for his chest face, having plenty of time to do so because of how slow he is. Then, I dodged a spell or two when he actually stopped floating around, and cast something for once. And even with a buff to his stats, a Conqueror's Parry Apps boosted Fracture Dart on his chest face, was still very unpleasant for him. When he went into his vortex phase, I waited for the portal to close, then I shot him with a single fracture dart and it immediately staggered him. After that, he was a sitting duck, and I killed him just as he started getting back up again. I cleared Damon on my first attempt, and this challenge run came to a rather anticlimactic conclusion. I suppose we're not completely done yet. We need to defeat the Seneschal to officially complete the main questline. The Seneschal himself is very easy, but the process of getting to him throws a wrench in this challenge run entirely. We need 20 wake stones to open a portal to the Seneschal's chamber so we can meet him. Have you figured out the problem yet? We need to submit 20 wake stones from our inventory. We can't just leave them in storage and submit from there. We have to carry them in our inventory. And as I'm sure you're aware, we cannot carry 11.8 kilograms worth of wake stones, let alone anything. The NPC will also not let us submit the wake stones one at a time. We have to give 20 of them to her in a single go from our inventory, not the storage. The obvious solution is to use the duplication exploit I was using earlier to get Mountie Bank to duplicate wake stones into our inventory. The problem with this is that when he duplicates a wake stone, it comes out as a forgery. We cannot submit forgeries to complete the quest as they are considered a completely different item, an item that the NPC won't accept. You can also duplicate wake stone shards when you have three of these shards in your inventory, they create a wake stone. But these shards have the same problem when it comes to forgeries. Manti Bank will give you a wake stone shard forgery, not a real shard, so this won't work for the quest either. The Ur Dragon drops 20 wake stones upon his death, but I don't have the carry weight to pick them off the ground. Once I reach over encumbered status, I can't pick up any more items from the ground. A possible solution would be using Master Thief to steal wake stones from enemies. You can steal items even when your carry weight is maxed out, in the same way duplicating items puts them in your inventory regardless of your carry weight. Unfortunately, there are no enemies in the game you can steal wake stones from. They only appear after the enemy dies, in which you must pick them off the ground, which I can't do if my carry weight is capped. For the first time in this entire challenge run, I will have to break a rule. 
these are the current rules that have been established over the course of the run. The rule we'll have to break is the No Sunu rule. Sunu is a rank 5 fighter augment that gives you a 20kg bonus to your carry weight. With 20 extra kilos, we'll be able to easily carry 20 wake stones. All we have to do is reach fighter rank 5. This is literally the last quest I have to do in order to beat the game, so it's incredibly frustrating having to break a rule when I'm so close to the finish line. I could kill Grigori, the Gazer, Dark Bishop and both Daemon forms without breaking a single one of my rules, only for the stupid quest to invalidate my run. But I'm too far in to call it quits and you've watched too much of the video to not see it to the end. We're going to take a single L in this one stat challenge run and grind out Sunu so I can carry 20 wake stones to the NPC. We need to grind fighter to rank 5 to unlock Sunu and unfortunately fighter's weapons are heavily restricted due to my carry weight. Every zero star enhancement sword in the game weighs over 1 kilogram. The lightest sword is the silver rapier but it still weighs 1.18 kilos at rank 0. However, if you get it to rank 3 enhancement, it weighs exactly 1 kilo, which means Fireboy can equip it. Mercedes gave me the sword earlier in the run, but there's one small problem. I fucking sold it. Instead, I went to the inn, swapped to fighter, and equipped two rings of perseverance, then I grabbed two throw blasts from my storage. From the inn, I'd run up the stairs and straight into the nobles' quarters where the hostile guards were. I'd throw both throw blasts at the guards, then teleport back to the inn to pick up another two, run back to nobles' quarters, throw blast the guards, teleport back, grab more throw blasts, run back, throw blast the guards. And I did that until I was fighter vocation rank 5. I could have used the mounty bank duplication method to keep multiple throw blasts on me, but it was unnecessary. It only took me 7 minutes to get to rank 5 with the method I used just now. I went back to the inn and purchased Sunu for Fireboy. Having this much extra carry weight makes me feel filthy. I can carry so much stuff now, why would someone ever need to hold so much stuff? I slotted Sunu and it was time to come to terms with my sin and get some wake stones to finish the game. I was only going to use Sunu to get 20 wake stones and hand them in. Once that quest was complete, I was going to unequip it. Fireboy jumps down the Everfall and enters the Chamber of Confusion. We have to beat the evil eye here in order to progress further into the Everfall, which meant I had to confront my gazer PTSD. I waited for the gazer, I mean evil eye, to lower his shield, then I pelted him with fracture darts, stun locking him until he died. The kill got Fireboy two wake stones. He then headed to the Chamber of Lament to kill the Ur Dragon. If you kill the Ur Dragon, you're rewarded with 20 wake stones. Unfortunately, fighting him with only Fractured Art was very annoying and I gave up immediately. Instead, I went to the different chambers to try and farm wake stones there. I wandered around each chamber, slaughtering the large monsters because they dropped the most wake stones. I killed a golem, cyclops, some whites, a gore chimera, and even a worm, looting the wake stones from their bodies until I had managed to gather 20 of them. It was the moment of truth. Fireboy gave 20 wake stones to Quince and we opened a portal into the rift. Instead of diving in right away to fight the final boss, I teleported back to BBI. I purchased the strongest magic bow Barok had for sale and then swapped Fireboy's vocation over to Magic Archer. After equipping him with his bow and two rings of perseverance, it was back to Grand Sarin. I needed to get to rank 9 in Magic Archer before we fight God and I'll explain why later. For now, Fireboy spent several minutes killing guards until he maxed out his Magic Archer rank. I then went back to the inn and purchased the skill Great Sacrifice. Again, I'll explain why later. For now, it was time to dive into the rift to confront God. After entering the rift, Fireboy shoots God a couple of times and he dies. Then he gets back up, so Fireboy shoots him some more until he dies very hard. But he was just kidding, and he's still alive. For anyone who's beaten Dragon's Dogma, it's common knowledge that the Seneschal's stats don't live up to his godhood, as he's one of the easiest enemies in the entire game. Fireboy is then asked to roll through this linear path, and when he reaches the end, God reveals his true identity as default male one. He also forcefully summons Water Girl to fight alongside Fireboy. Hold on, excuse me, your godliness. You aren't allowed to summon my pawn. That goes against the rules of this challenge run. That is why I got Great Sacrifice from Magic Archer. Great Sacrifice is a skill that lets you shoot an incredibly powerful projectile in exchange for the life of your pawn. So if I just shoot Great Sacrifice into the sky, I can send Water Girl's soul into the depths of heaven, removing her from the game while still not using the skill to inflict damage. Fireboy charges up Great Sacrifice and aims it at the sky, but the skill just stops. I can't fire it, it's just stuck there, charging forever. I have no choice but to cancel the skill and continue fighting the Seneschal with Water Girl by my side. Thankfully, the Seneschal is comically easy, so the fight's over before Water Girl can make any worthwhile contributions. That being said, this fight is also scripted. In order to deal the final blow to God, you or your pawn must grapple the Seneschal while he's charging up his big attack. Then the other must land the finishing strike to defeat him. If the Seneschal isn't grappled, he won't die. By the power of the game's script, I was forced to let Water Girl grapple God so I could actually damage him, killing him for good. 
There's also the fact that your pawn plays a major role in the final cutscene, so it makes sense that the devs put safety measures to ensure that your pawn is present for the end of the game. It's unfortunate that this section couldn't abide by my no pawns rule, but it's a scripted sequence required to beat the game, so I couldn't do anything about it. The Seneschal gives Fireboy the God's Bane Blade and he quickly puts it to use. It's now Fireboy's duty to take on the role of God for the world, but his short attention span causes him to kill himself out of boredom. Water Girl is like, damn, he really do be dead. Then they wash up on the shores of Cassidus. Fireboy's loving husband Fornival is there to greet him, and they have hot gecks on the beach. And that's it. The game is complete, as is this challenge run. It's a shame that the game's mechanics force me to break my no sinew and no pawn rules right at the very end, but I still managed to clear all the actually difficult major bosses while abiding by the rules I set for myself. And so my first ever challenge run comes to an end. I'm honestly surprised my playtime is just a little less than 18 hours. My death's number is very embarrassing though, please don't look at it. I'd like to once again thank Austin Shelton for providing the mods that made this challenge possible. Fireboy's journey has come to an end, but not before we thank our lovely patrons for the contributions and the patience of all our viewers. I hope this video was worth the wait. I've got plenty of Dragon's Dogma videos on the way in the years to come, so I hope you stick around.